Hello and welcome to Perspectives, the APT's podcast which explores contemporary issues related to torture prevention and dignity in detention. I am Audrey Olivier Meralt, APT's Deputy Secretary General, and this episode continues our series on the Mendes Principles on Effective Interviewing, a new approach to end coercive interviewing. Today, we feature a special conversation between two individuals responsible for bringing the Mendes Principles to life, former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendes, and former APT Secretary General, Mark Thompson. Together, they co-chaired the steering committee established to develop what would become the principles on effective interviewing for investigations and information gathering, with inputs from experts and practitioners across the globe. The principles are designed to support investigators collect reliable information, not a confession, using rapport-based interviewing techniques. They also uphold the rights of those being interviewed by ensuring that key safeguards are respected in practice. In today's conversation, Mark and Juan discuss the motivation for establishing the principles, the process and challenges of drafting them, and how the principles add value to efforts in all countries, regardless of legal culture or tradition, to prevent torture and treatment. We'll begin with Mark. Well, nice to be here. Um, so Juan and I, uh, we chaired uh, the process for the drafting and adoption of these principles on effective interviewing investigations and information gathering. So that's what we're going to talk about today, because there are all sorts of things we could talk about. Uh, but uh, we'll focus on that. And what I'd like to do is ask Juan some questions about um, the origins of the idea, uh, the process of putting it together, and the significance of this. You know, why, why, what, what, can this what can this do to make a change that's going to be important for protecting people's um, human rights? So Juan uh, persuaded me to co-chair <laughs> with him uh, this process, but it's Juan's idea. And so I think it's important to try and find out a little bit more today about where Juan got the idea from. Well, obviously, uh, I've been thinking about uh, why uh, you know, the, the need to obtain confessions leads to so much torture and so much grief around the world, and I've been thinking about it for many, many years. But in fact, a much more proximate cause was when I was a special rapporteur. Um, I, I observed in many countries that I visited that uh, you know, the moment in which one is most vulnerable to torture is when you are faced with the in interrogation by uh, investigators, law enforcement, etc. And, and then also, uh, uh, I also had the good fortune of consulting with a lot of people uh, that approached the, the mandate with ideas. And I, I learned that uh, Northern European states particularly had gone through a process of you know, looking back on what went wrong on investigations and determining uh, very specifically and very, uh, in a very organized manner to substitute the brutality of torture for a process of uh, um, in interviews that was much more based on rapport. And then I, I thought I would write uh, my last report to the General Assembly precisely on that topic. And uh, we conducted a consultation uh, and uh, there was so much interest, such very good people coming to join us that um, the, the report to the General Assembly wrote itself almost. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the, uh, I had also the very good fortune that the report didn't, uh, did have a certain shelf life. It didn't end with the presentation at the General Assembly. And soon thereafter, there were all kinds of people um, in, showing interest, and many with great experience, uh, professional and academic, uh, on why we needed uh, something like this. That's, a, that's the, the origin, uh, from my perspective at least, and uh, I'm, really, I'm really excited to note that, uh, you know, one has a, an idea, but uh, uh, if it is a good idea like this one, then a lot of people uh, volunteer to join you. I, I remember you, you were behind a, a report 
that came out from the Inter-American Commission, uh, which for me was a very important report on uh, the application of law um, in th uh, at the moment of threats of terrorism, etc. Um, it was a very important statement at the time yes. uh, to defend that principle of of maintaining uh, human rights law uh, at, at, at at all times, uh, including uh, in the in that situation. I assume that that was also another reason why you felt. A, you need to take on the work of Special Rapporteur, but also to come up with, with um, a, 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 an approach that challenged that no? in, in a convincing way. Yes, absolutely. I was the president of the commission at the time and mm -hmm. wrote a, a report on human rights in combating uh, terrorism. And it was at the height of the <clears throat> so-called global war on terror, where the United States in particular uh, were almost publicly uh, advocating that new rules were necessary mm -hmm. and the new rules among other things was taking the gloves off uh, during interrogation mm -hmm. and I think at that time it, especially we were concerned that the argument that torture works uh, <clears throat> was gaining ground especially in the in the in the popular culture and I still think we need to recover that ground we're still kind of condition to think that torture works and it's, you know, ugly and, um, you know, something, but somebody has to do it, so quote unquote. But we were kind of pushing back on whether torture was worth using or not. Right. We, were, <clears throat> we were saying it's not true that torture works. Uh, and we were putting up to it the prohibitions in international law that have remained uh, absolute uh, all, uh, all along. Yeah. But uh, this step, the drafting of these principles, is about offering an alternative that uh, has been proven to be much more uh, effective, not only more professional and more ethical um, and more legal, or absolutely legal, but uh, also more effective in fighting crime. And that, I think, is a piece uh, that, uh, that was missing and that uh, the, the principles try to fill in. I was at the Association for the Prevention of Torture at the time, and we asked the question, does prevention actually work? So we commissioned researchers to do this study, and the reason I make the, uh, the link to this is not just to promote uh, excellent work, but it's the link to the, the principles, because um, the, uh, one of the conclusions of this study uh, was that it's when uh, safeguards are applied that you have uh, most effective prevention of torture and treatment? Well, I, I remember the uh, process of production of, uh, of that book, and what was really good about that book was that it, uh, it has case studies, of, uh, especially of countries that have at least experimented some reduction in the incidence of torture, and why. I think it's an important contribution. Uh, at the same time, um, you know what what uh, was needed was for uh, countries to or states to take seriously the consequences of torturing. Mm -hmm. And um, in the countries that had, you know, some decades ago, conducted the process of substituting uh, harsh interrogation for rapport-based uh, interrogation or uh, interviews. The, uh, the reason was that they wanted to avoid judicial error. They wanted mm -hmm. to avoid, you know, uh, jeopardizing the whole investigation by uh, forcing the nullification of everything that had happened. And I always reflected that that works when courts and prosecutors take seriously the exclusionary rule and and, uh, and other sanctions uh, that work against torture. It, 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 it remains to be proven where it wor whether it works in <clears throat> jurisdictions where the courts are complicit on the torture. They actually look, look the other way and don't, uh, don't apply the exclusionary rule, don't exclude evidence obtained under torture, mm -hmm. and don't investigate and sanction those people who do torture uh, because in a way, they are comfortable with interrogations based on coercion of, of different sorts. 
But that's why I think we needed a, a document that showed that uh, the true professionalism of people investigating crime involved also knowing, uh, learning and knowing how to conduct uh, interviews without violating the rights of the person interviewed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, Let, let's move on to process because you you made the proposal at the in your final report to the General Assembly. It was well received. I remember at the time the states uh, responding positive to mm -hmm. they liked the idea, and um, there was then uh, you know the important task of bringing together a group of of people who had the right type of expertise uh, that was relevant to try to draft something like this. Yeah, the, the, the first step actually happened literally two months after my report to the General Assembly, and it happened here in the premises of the Association for the Prevention of Torture. It was a, a very encouraging moment, uh, and that's when uh, we decided that we needed Mark to be a co-chair <laughs> uh, because of your, your long association with APT and also because we wanted APT to be you know, institutionally involved. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, proved, uh, proved very uh, true in, immediately because we were able to uh, be joined by people who were very interested in this and, as you say, had uh, the experience of uh, uh, <clears throat> interviews uh, for investigative purposes, but also people who had studied from different uh, social sciences per perspectives, from criminology, psychology, um, and even neurology to show why torture doesn't work or works uh, uh, for um, you know cross purposes with uh, finding the truth and uh, uh, and uh, establishing justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was really impressed with that. And we also had the enthusiastic assistance of people who had been in the forefront of opposing the trend towards uh, you know, bringing back torture, especially in the context of the global war on terror. Mm -hmm. They added not only their experience, but their prestige. And so we had so much interest that we were able to create this steering committee, and but also uh, had some other people join our drafting committee, and then also an advisory council. And so we... We ended up with more than 100 people participating in this to get to the point of having a, a document to offer to the international community. And um, it took us four years, but I think that's a testament of how important it was to get this right. Yeah, I think the Tibetans say that if you have a choice of two routes, always choose the hardest because it's far more enriching. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, it was a difficult process because we had such a, a, a vast group of people involved. Um, but uh, they brought their experience to the table, which I think it was just essential for, 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 for this to be yeah. um, <coughs> something that would have added value. And uh, you know, the involvement of former investigators, the involvement of, of, of uh, uh, human rights lawyers, involvement of... Um, of people working in academia and I think that for me was also really interesting and it's quite exceptional to bring together that, um, that multidisciplinary team to work on a specific human rights challenge. No? Yeah, I think in fact uh, the, the, the principles document itself, uh, especially the first chapter, mm. is a very powerful argument yeah. Uh, for why torture not only doesn't work, it actually is counterproductive. I mean, it's just a summary of the very rich literature on the matter, but it uh, it works uh, very effectively that, that way. Yeah, I mean, the, the first principle being that uh, effective interviewing is instructed by science, law, and ethics. You know, that's a very strong statement. Huh? Um, so... We, we chose the hard route, uh, which is to draft collectively. Um, I, we, I think we went through maybe 60 drafts or so. Uh, but there was um, an important shift halfway through the process, uh, just to take you back to that. Remember how we were, because we had asked 
the legal people to draft what was essential to go into a protocol, and we asked the practitioners, investigators, to draft what was also important to go, and then we tried to bring the two together. But we realized it wasn't going to fly, and that we were going to, the people, we were trying to rewrite uh, human rights law and humanitarian law. <laughs> we, we realized we had to take a different approach. Um, uh, and that's where we came up with the idea of, of a principles approach. Uh, yeah, it, it, a, a, another example of where by doing something collectively, we could reflect on things and be prepared to adapt and change. And, um, uh, and I, I think you know, that's important as well to, to note that, that yeah. um, we tested this with, uh, with other people and realized that this was not something that would be any additional value. In fact, we were getting into, into pro problems because people would say we, we, we were not thorough enough, etc. But we had meetings in Brazil, Tunisia, and Bangkok, I think, with yeah. the three. But we met with um, law enforcement officials in and they were very receptive, and they liked the idea of, of the idea of the principles, though, this, which was also very encouraging for us. Yeah, and even now, uh, all the reception that we get tends to be very positive. You've been listening to Juan Mendes and Mark Thompson in conversation. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Perspectives. We'll be back soon with another episode in this series exploring the Mendes principles. And if you have any idea for us to cover on perspectives, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email on apt at apt.ch or find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to your company next time.